we are with our um, second speaker that I'd like to introduce. And with this next presentation, we're really going to switch gears um, to a, a totally different topic. And it has to do with how your employees find out about what medical care options they have. Because illness is extremely stressful um, to, our, to our staff, whether it's their illnesses, their family's illnesses, their parents' illnesses, and sometimes going through with a process of being ill or needing medical services can take so much productivity away from your employees in dealing with it. So I think that what Gary has to offer is a, a way that he works with employers to help their employees um, understand the medical decisions and how to access medical care and to be more informed consumers. Gary is the president of a company called The Medical Guide, and it's actually an educational tool to help employees identify and avoid unnecessary medical care. So on the flip side of it, those of you who wear the HR hat, those of you who are CFOs who are making insurance decisions for your health, for your employees' health care, this also plays into how you might be able to control your costs. So, um, you know, we have the wellness program that generally ends up keeping the healthy employees healthy, and sometimes the um, employees who are less healthy on, on the same path and doesn't and don't necessarily address the, the issues um, regarding that. So I think that the medical guide is something that helps uh, employees look for tools to address those who are in the medical system as well, in the healthcare system. Gary um, is a lecturer about healthcare issues um, throughout the Northeast. I've met him through our, uh, my profession, through Harvard. He's a often a CE provider for Harvard Pilgrim and for some uh, for our National Association of Health Underwriters for Balance. So I'm going to let him uh, get on with his presentation and thank you for coming, Gary. Thanks, Thanks for inviting me and welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> you guys haven't heard the talk yet. You won't clap at the end, don't worry. Um, but thanks very much for inviting me. As our first speaker, as Nicole was talking, I thought, what the hell am I doing here? You guys introduced yourselves. You're all wellness experts. I know next to nothing. Oh, I can't say I know next to nothing about wellness, and even less about design teams and steering. <laughs> I, I don't work in that. I don't live in that world. I don't know anything about it. Um, so what I, my area of expertise is what people do after the wellness program ends, if you will. Like, a wellness program will reduce your chance of having diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, whatever. But it doesn't eliminate the chance of getting sick. And at some point, even if you have a wonderful wellness program that works incredibly well, someone's going to develop cancer or have a heart attack or something. So where I pick up is what happens when you start interacting with the medical care system at the end of your wellness program. Um, so I'll go through a few slides here and tell a few stories. But <clears throat> as we go through this, please interrupt and ask questions or make comments or disagree. I'm not that good of a researcher, so much of what I have to say is probably wrong. Please tell me. I, the floor is yours. Um, and, the, and the academic reason for saying that is that studies fairly conclusively have shown that the best way to learn something is to write it down. So send me an email. I promise I'll respond by saying, thank you for your insightful email. And then, so, so you, but, but writing it will help solidify some of these ideas. The second best way to learn is to talk. So please talk, and that way you'll learn things. You'll remember what, the, what you said. You won't remember what I said, because it's probably not worth remembering. But you'll remember what you said, and that is a good thing. The worst way to learn is to listen. And you forget something like 85% of what you hear within 24 hours. So um, talk, ask questions, make comments, disagree, tell your own personal stories. It's a whole lot more interesting for everybody. Um, so let me just start this off with a couple of questions. Does anybody know how much money we waste in medical care? Not by excessive administration or fraudulent billing, not, not that stuff, but what, how much money goes to medical care that simply doesn't get people healthy? Anybody? Hundred, we have 160 billion in the front row. Anybody want to top that? I'm a, a lot. Okay. <laughs> All right. The the generally accepted answer developed by some folks at uh, Dartmouth, uh, the Dartmouth Institute for Healthcare, which is the center of studying all this stuff, is about a third of all money spent on medical care 
is wasted on unnecessary care. Round numbers, oh, six or eight hundred billion a year. Uh, per policy, $2,500, $3,000 per policy. That's the amount of money that you guys are spending when you negotiate your insurance policy that goes to unnecessary care that does not help employees get healthier. And we can pretty much predict what some of those uh, medical interventions are that won't get people healthy. Um, so just remember that you don't want unnecessary medical care that doesn't get you healthy. You want medical care that gets you healthy. So when you're wellness, you follow the wellness programs and you eat well and you exercise and you keep your stress down and all that stuff. And then if you get sick, you want medical care that works. And that's what I'll talk about. Um, so we'll kick this off with a quote from the founder of the Dartmouth, I don't know if you guys can read this, uh, the Dartmouth Institute for Healthcare, John Wenberg, who's sort of the guru of this field, said, look guys, a lot of medical care just simply doesn't work very well. I'll give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> you guys know what a stress test is? You get on the, the, the treadmill and you walk, they hook up some gizmos to you and get a bunch of data. There's a website that's a very useful website that I think everyone should know about called Choosing Wisely. Anybody ever heard of Choosing Wisely? No. Okay. Choosing Wisely is a brilliant website. I'm not, I'm not kidding, I'm not being facetious here. It's a terrific website. It's funded by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation. What the American Board of Internal Medicine did was call up all of the specialty medical organizations they could find, like the American College of Cardiology, for example. They have about 50 listed on their website. And they said, tell us five things that your members do that they shouldn't do, and we'll put them on a website. We'll call it Choosing Wisely. So this is one example of the 250 or so things on the website. There's some duplication, but I'll just read to you, for example, what the American College of Cardiology said in their official statement, voted on by the board of directors, about stress tests. Don't have them. Don't have stress tests in the initial evaluation of patients unless they're symptomatic. So you don't have stress tests to get a baseline so you can watch what happens over time. They said, don't do it. This is a cardiologist, not me. I'm not, you know, that's some way out academic who's saying, hey, this stuff doesn't work. This is the American College of Cardiology saying, don't do them. And don't do them as part of routine follow-up. Just don't do them. And here's the reason why. This can lead to unnecessary invasive procedures without any proven impact. Because all of us have abnormalities. And if we look hard enough at everybody in this room with uh, uh, a sufficient number of tests and a sufficient level of detail, we all have something wrong with us that will justify medical intervention. So the cardiologist has said, hey, this is one, this is a biggie. Just don't do it. If you're symptomatic, yeah. If you're not symptomatic, don't. And if your doctor recommends it, ask a question about this. Right? So just, I just want to suggest one thing. I, I could talk from now until 3 o'clock about the rest of them. But I just want to give you guys a taste of uh, uh, the resources available to teach people how to avoid unnecessary interventions that are expensive and increase your risk of harm. Unnecessary, always increase. Medi remember, all medical interventions have some sort of risk of harm. You can even, there's a story, some of you guys might remember, uh, a little girl, 13-year-old girl on the Cape, she took some children's Motrin, or dad gave her children's Motrin, she had a headache or something, ended up going blind. It was a $63 million settlement report in the book. Everything has risk. So if you get unnecessary care that won't benefit you, you get the advantage, if you will, of all of the risks, all of the potential harms, plus you pay for it, without any upside benefit. All right, so here's one, that was one example. There, I, I want to tell you about a huge study that was published in the Journal of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. That's read by about six people. Um, <laughs> I read the summary, I didn't read the whole thing. Um, anyway, this fellow, Prasad, I'll talk about him a little bit later uh, through the lecture. <clears throat> Senior fellow at the National Institutes of Health. You know, this is like a big time academic. He and a team went through every issue of the New England Journal of Medicine from 2001 to 2010. And they, they looked at every single article, which sounds to me like the working definition of hell, but anyway. So we went through the, all the articles, and they pulled out all of the articles that were evaluations of routine established medical practices. We want to see how well they work. Here's what they found. 40% of established medical practices 
were ineffective or harmful. It's picked up by the New York Times. Not a lot of medical, uh, the popular press didn't pick this up for some reason. But they found over the 10 years, 363 articles, that were trials of established routine medical interventions. 40% were ineffective, another 40% or so were beneficial, and 20% roughly correct clear. So your odds of benefiting, if the medical intervention hasn't been tested, is about 50-50, it's not pressure. I don't happen to like 50-50 odds. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie and I were at a convention, the, Mass, the National Association of Health Underwriters in Las Vegas, two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was. And as I walked around the different gaming tables, the best odds I could find were 50-50. The dealer would flip a card, you flip a card, high card wins. I didn't take those odds. Yeah. Wouldn't, I wouldn't bet a buck, and I'm certainly not going to bet my health at a 50-50. And remember, <clears throat> you're at 50-50 that there's a benefit. It might be a small benefit. It's not necessarily a big benefit. So half the time, you get no benefit or only harm. You get cost and no benefit. Half the time. So here's, there's a, a, a YouTube, you can Google Prasad YouTube, it's a five minute video, seven, seven minutes long. Like and he talks about his article, very articulate. It's not a well produced video, but it's really easy to follow. And here's some quotes from, this is a senior fellow, National Institutes of Health, top notch academic. Patients who are embarking on procedures, screening tests, or diagnostic tests should really try to figure out if they're based on good evidence. Of those things that lack good evidence, about half of them are incorrect. And we know this. We can predict that. So the question to ask your doctor, when your doctor says, no, you look great. I'm going to give you a pill. I'm going to give you a pill or something. The, the obvious question to ask is, how good is the evidence? Are there comparative studies? I mean, if there are not comparative studies, you know that it won't work half the time, at least. The continued use jeopardizes patient health. This is, if you will, the official statement of the National Institute, is close to the official statement of the National Institutes of Health that you can get. Like, if the evidence ain't good, don't do it, even if it sounds good. Now, very often, those of you who negotiate health plans want to get transparency, which means figure out what it costs. Because you can get the same treatment here, and you can get the same treatment there. That one costs $1,200, this one costs $600, so then the $600. I completely disagree with that. I think that that's a fallacious, harmful, and bad idea. And I would not look at price except at the last minute. Because I want to get care that gets me healthy. And I have yet to meet someone who says, you know, we're, we're having a bit of a financial problem in my family. Things are a little bit tight. My spouse's hours were cut. So although my kid's sick, I really don't want the best care. I'd like the third best care. I haven't heard that. I, you know, I don't hear that. But when you shop based on price, that's exactly what you're doing. You're saying, I don't care how good it is, I just want the cheap one. I wouldn't shop that way. I don't think anybody else should. So I think looking at price is a really bad idea. And the question then to talk about, that it's probably relevant for your, nobody's asked a question yet, though. Um, it's probably relevant for your employees. How can you figure out what's good and what's not good? How do we figure out What's unnecessary? So I'll give you a theoretical answer, and then I'll give you a practical answer, and then we'll go through a little bit of a case study. So here's a four-step program to figure out which kinds of preventive care, screening tests, medications, and some treatments work, and which ones don't. And this follows pretty much exactly from that study in the Mayo Clinic proceedings. And, and there's a whole lot more research. I just am quoting that one study, because I assume you don't want me to quote give you the bibliography of 400 studies to bore everybody. I mean, that might bore you anyhow, but, but that would really bore you. So here's the four-step process of figuring out, at least for one class of medical intervention, what works and what doesn't work. The first question you always have to ask, always, 100% of the time, what's my starting risk? The starting risk is your chance of having event X, die of breast cancer, lose your leg, diabetes, have a heart attack, whatever, <clears throat> if you don't have medical care. This is your control group. You guys all know what a comparative study is. The control group doesn't have the medication. The experimental group does have the medication. You see the delta between the two to figure out how well it works. 
So the first question always is, what's my chance of having it if I don't have it? Whatever you're worried about, you know, um, have a stroke. What's my chance of having it over the next five years if I don't have a medical intervention? If I don't take blood pressure lowering medication, what's my chance? And you always then have to compare that to what we call your modified risk. This is the experimental group. What's my chance of still having it? So the comparative question is, has the word still in it? What's my chance of still having the intervention if I get medical care? And that's the only way to figure out what the treatment benefit is. Now, remember that Dr. Prasad in his study said if it's not based on clinical trials, if we don't have comparative studies, it only works half the time. So when you say you're doctor, what's my starting risk? You know, I don't know, but it's a really good intervention. That's the, that's, you know, red flag, you're down to 50-50 benefit at all. If you can't get the answer to what my starting risk is of having the particular medical event absent uh, medical uh, intervention, if you can't get that answer, it hasn't been tested. If it hasn't been tested, you're a 50-50 benefit <coughs> and 50-50 ineffective or not. Right? Immediately your odds are back. So the definition of a treatment benefit for a whole class of medical interventions, not all, but for many, is starting risk minus modified risk, control group minus experimental group. That's how you figure out how well you need two numbers to figure out how well medical care works. If the answer that you get is one number, it's a bad number. You always need two numbers, okay? And then finally, you want to figure out how many people are harmed. So you can compare benefits to harms. That's how you figure out if the medical intervention is more beneficial than harmful or more harmful than beneficial. Let me go back to this uh, starting risk idea again, um, just to tell you how important it is. We don't talk about this. This is something we rarely talk about in medical care. But it's I saw people walking in this morning. It's been raining out. This is a linoleum floor. Why didn't you wear crash helmets <laughs> when you walked in here? Now, it turns out that if you fell on the floor because you had wet shoes and you hit your head, you might have long-term brain damage. And if you have long-term brain damage, you'll probably lose your job. If you don't have very good long-term disability insurance, you might not have enough money to spouse might have to quit his or her job to take care of you. That would reduce the amount of money in the family. Kids might not be able to go to college, might not be able to go to the college they want to. Their earning power will be lower in the future. Your spouse's life won't be, you know, the spouse won't be able to achieve all the things. It's a really bad deal. I happen to sell crash helmets. The normal price is $39.95, but today, because Julie was nice enough, you can get two crash helmets. For 1995, <laughs> choose the color, and it will re it will yeah. reduce your chance of having long-term head trauma when you walk down the halls of your office by 46 percent. Who wants one? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Why not? You want one? Oh, sure. You want one? Okay. <laughs> give me your money. I'll give you the crash helmet. Later. Why not? Why don't the rest of you want one? Why? Why does somebody tell me why you don't want a crash helmet? The chance of that happening. If you're start exactly. <laughs> if the starting risk is too low to worry about, then don't worry about it. All right? That's the critical issue. That's why you have to ask your doctor what the starting risk is. I can describe a whole lot of really horrible medical diseases, but if your starting risk is too low to worry about, then don't worry about it. Now, you can define what's too high or too low for you. You might have a different definition for you. That's cool. This is participation that Nicole was talking about. Have your employees participate in their medical decisions, but teach them how to do it. All right, so I'll give you some, I'll give you a case study now. We'll go through average numbers. Remember, average means half people are below, above and half are below. So your own risk might be higher or lower than the numbers I'll give you. But these are average numbers, and I'll give you the references at the end. Just tell me if you think this is a medical intervention that you want, it's a test that you want. Two people die. Per 1,000 people over 10 years. Is that a high enough risk to be tested for? And I understand that there might be more expensive tests and less expensive tests and all that stuff. <clears throat> the other way of saying, by the way, two die per 1,000 over 10 years is that you have a 99.8% chance of having nothing to worry about. Uh, 
Now, there are various behavioral differences. If you say two diaper thousands, I'm going to do one of those. If you say you have a 99.8% chance of being fine, most people say, So there's a whole lot in the presentation that gets a clinical response. So does anybody, there are no right or wrong answers, by the way. Uh, what's high enough for one person might be low for somebody else, and that's cool. Does anybody think that this is a high, they, they sort of want to say, yeah, glad you talked about this one. I want to go out and be tested right away. No, I'm not saying uh, okay. That's fine. It's consumer driven. It's participatory. You make your own decision. That's fine. Starting risk minus modified risk. Let's see how well it works. Because maybe it works really great. And if it works really great, you might want to change your, you say, hey, you know, low risk. But, you know, it eliminates the, the problems. Okay, fine. Turns out that one in a thousand still dies over 10 years. Starting risk was two in a thousand died, 99.8% of people are fine. And your modified risk is one in a thousand still dies. You increase your chance of not dying over 10 years from 99.8% to 99.9%. What do you think works well enough to have so your treatment benefit is one life saved per thousand people screen over? Okay. You increase your chance of not having a problem from 99.8% to 99.9%. Anybody think this is cool? No, we're not. We are pretty emphatic in the middle here saying, nah, I'm not hanging out that one. No, I can tell you it's a painful intervention. But okay. And just in case anyone's interested, because I have, that's the next slide, so I have to go through it in order here. The harms. It turns out that 1 in 1,500 people have a potentially life-threatening complication from the test. Now, Potent. I, I don't know how many are really serious life, and how many are just sort of, you know, little minor problems. I don't know the frequency distribution, but I do. I, but this is the, the statistic that about one in fifteen hundred have some sort of complication. All right. Final chance. Anybody want to go out and get this? Talk to your doctor about it. Say, nah. Oh, okay, everyone. All right. Oh, Julie's saying maybe. Oh no, you're scratching your shoulder. Okay. <laughs> okay, this right. is no no. Um, no history or whatever of this. No, no, no. no this is this just is, in general. This is average, yeah. Okay. And again, your particular chance might starting risk might be much higher, higher than this. or much to, or much lower. Okay, average means half or about half or below. Okay. So your risk might be fifteen hundred or point zero 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 one in hundred, so a thousand. You know, so okay. So these are the numbers. These are average numbers. Anybody know what it is? Colonoscopy. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> You're the first person who's guessed it. I've like, given this lecture no, like 15 no, no, no. times. <laughs> That's right. It's colonoscopy for people in their 50s. Oh my God. Those are the numbers. Oh, Here are the references. Good. I don't have to go wow. again. Well, <laughs> starting risk. Guys, starting risk minus modified risk equals treatment benefit. Now, I'm a, I'm a pretty good researcher. I, I don't think I'm in uh, Nicole's class. But I'm, I'm okay. I mean, so I'm pretty close. I got my starting risk estimates from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, which publishes, published about eight years ago, starting risk. That one, they do a big chart of starting risk. You can look it up for 10 or 15 different diseases. The benefit comes from a few places, including this quote, I, I have a video somewhere, of Dr. Adams on ABC News saying, colonoscopy Plus, uh, colonoscopies reduce your risk of dying of colon cancer by 50%. All right, I can do 50% of two. I can do that. And there's another big study in Britain. And the risks come from the Johns Hopkins Medicine website. So I'm pretty close on my numbers. So like you're saying, if you had history in your family of, you know, right, then different then story, then you can talk to your doctor. Yeah. But I caution you, most people think when they look at medical numbers, Average means lowest possible, and that everybody's risk is higher. Average means half or above and half or below. So your risk might be not two in a thousand, but .0001 in a thousand. This was, I think, published um, just recently in AARP. Maybe. That's that you should or should have. Mm. I think yeah. it was in yeah. the it was in the Did AARP. they say you have it or don't? It, I think it said not to. Oh, to no. Tell you the truth. Oh. Oh. But I don't, great. I don't know if it's like the baseline or if it was like your baseline should be done and then if nothing comes back, you shouldn't have one for another 10 years or something like that. That's, what That's why I think it's That's not one that have been done yearly. That, but I don't think it was saying never to have a colonoscopy done at, 
at the age of 50, like your baseline? Or I think it was a higher, higher age. age. Yeah. Gee, we, I showed the data to this entire group. Nobody wanted it. I wonder, I wonder who wrote that article. I don't know, but it was in AARP mm. just recently. AARP must be right. <laughs> I, don't I don't know, but just, just saying that there's stuff out there. So I, I think it would be your own, like you say, your own personal comfort risk. Or what, what you're comfortable. I might yeah. be comfortable in playing the slots. That's and right. And a higher risk. And That's right. And the right. risk that you would wish to take. Julie, tell us the answer. Well, I was just going to comment. I think that what what we tend to hear in the news is we hear that 50 percent, and we don't we don't know what it relates to, and that's where um, whether it's talking about having a colonoscopy or taking um, medication for high cholesterol, it's like you just you need to know as but Gary said, the two numbers, because the 50% is the shocker. 50%, you know, like if I get a colonoscopy, I'm going to reduce my risk of, col of having colon cancer by 50%. But if my risk is only one in a thousand, I've only reduced it to one in 2,000. Like, so it, it's all that, that relativity that I think is really, um, you know, important. And, and how, how we help our employees get like get these evaluated, you know, the ability to talk to their providers is, is something that's that's really key. Um, one, two, three. I was just going to say, the other thing that contributes to that is everybody knows somebody who's died of colorectal cancer or had it. So the right. emotion comes into it regardless of what the epidemiology might say. Right. In the back row? And I think I... I would be remiss if I didn't speak up from a public health perspective. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think this conversation is enlightening, and I think <clears throat> an undertone that I'm picking up from this is the the absolute crucial importance of patient activation and decision making. 100% agree. Yes. That said, before everybody in the room cancels their colonoscopies, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. from a public health perspective, I think the intervention should probably be improving the quality of systematic delivery of care in the healthcare system, and then engaging patients in making appropriate decisions for their care, rather than shifting the risk assessment to the patient. Right. I, I always get that, and, and I invite people to use the data any way you want to. But I want to caution that, and I, I don't mean to pick on you at all because I appreciate the fact that you spoke up, but hey, AARP said do it, I'll do it. Well, who knows who bought that study? I mean, I don't know. Might have been the Colonoscopy Association, you know, funded by unnecessary, who knows? I don't know. If you get the numbers, then you increase your chance of benefiting from 50-50 to whatever the numbers are. It turns out, according to ABC News, there you go, there's 50%. If someone tells me I have 50% chance of reducing my chance of dying, I'm there. Yeah, hey, terrific. In fact, it, whoops, sorry. I did this wrong. There we go. You slash it from 50% from to 2 to 1 in 1,000. Just like Julie said, okay. Slash it 50%, I'm there. 2 to 1 in 1,000, eh. Meanwhile, oh, boy, oh boy, I'm jumping here. The examination has an, according to Johns Hopkins, you can go to their website, this has an extremely small risk of complications between one and two, uh, sorry, one tenth and two tenths of a percent, which is between one and two and a thousand. So my question is, how can it be a huge benefit, which is between one and two and a thousand, and a small risk, which is between one and two and a thousand? Any, I, that's a question. Anybody wants to answer it, please jump right in. Tell me how the same number can be huge and small. I don't get it. I think the answer is emotion. And people don't look at numbers. They, they say, oh, here's an authoritative source. It's a website called the American Physicians of Colonoscopy Expertise that did a major study. Who knows what that, how good it was. So get numbers. And the reason, oh, jump right in, yeah. I think, as someone who works with cancer survivors, so yeah, there is emotion involved here for me as well. But we're talking about the risk of death yep. from from colon cancer yep. and not needing a colonoscopy because that risk is so small at two in a thousand right. or one in a thousand. Um, I can I am concerned that you know you can have colon cancer mm -hmm. if you don't have the colonoscopy and it goes undetected. Yep. Fine, you may not die from that, but it can metastasize. It can spread to other organs, which can cause you may not die from it because the treatments have come a long way. Right. But it will definitely, from what I know, dramatically increase or impact your lifestyle with going through 
chemotherapy, radiation every day for six weeks, blah, 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 blah. So that shouldn't be only risk factor. Guys, I just introduced yeah. the numbers and said, right. here's your starting but risk, here's your modified risk, nobody yeah. wanted it. Then we said colonoscopy, and people said, oh, yeah, you got to have it. No, I knew so, what you were talking yeah. about. When I saw yeah. this, and I was like, I know he's talking about the colonoscopy. Right. But it's a little bit uh, disturbing for me. <laughs> I know you're just presenting the numbers, but sort of putting this thought into people's head that they shouldn't have a colonoscopy. And you're also talking about a small part, you're saying, in their 50s. Yes. Just specifically in your 50s? Absolutely. Yes. Right. Without uh, there, any the risk change like you said for family history or anything else? Absolutely. So there are a lot more factors here at play. Yeah. That's what he was saying. Yeah. If you're 60 years old, then all this, we, just, it, we can just talk That's about That's completely correct. Right. All I'm suggesting is whatever the numbers are, learn them. Yeah. Yeah. Then talk to your doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Then talk to your doctor. Yeah. I mean, I think they reduce your risk. Everybody's signing up for it yep. at 50 years old. I right. just said, I, I got to tell my husband not to sign up for it because I'm more concerned about the bleeding and perforation and because there is no history. So I agree, you gotta peel back the onion a little bit and look at more of the numbers and make a decision based on a lot of factors. I think that the point that you guys are all making yeah. is the same point that Nicole made. Yeah. If you're empowered and you participate, you'll make better decisions. That's right. That's right. Whatever that's decision you make. Yeah. And, that, and that's why you get the numbers and you can make a wise decision. You don't have the numbers say, well, you know, it's a good thing and the the AARP says have, okay, fine, great. And we know that a third of medical spending is wasted on unnecessary care. That's pretty. That's a pretty hard number. And we know that Dr. Prasad in his big study, and there are others like that, said that 40% of established medical interventions are ineffective or harmful, 50% uh, are ineffective or harmful. If you get the numbers, all I'm suggesting is get the numbers you have. A, this is what we call an informed discussion with your doctor. Yeah. Also, yep. it's so important for, you know, as consumers to really understand this, and it's not so simple to understand. Yeah. And I also think physicians are often incented to test. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this really, you know, make a decision with your doctor is a little tricky. It's mm -hmm. like make a decision with, I don't know if it's the doctor, but I see what you're saying, the, the importance. Um, yeah. So I actually think that the newer generation of physicians that are being trained are being much more trained with access to the evidence base, and they are being trained with um, cost effectiveness being incorporated into that. And as we move away from fee-for-service reimbursement models in Massachusetts, 80% of um, providers in Mass Health and under Blue Cross are on an alternative quality contract payment so that they're not actually billing, they're not getting you know reimbursed $99 for every CBC right. and $30 for every foot check. It's they're, they're being paid a certain amount of money per member per month in order to keep their patients healthy. Yeah. So I think I think some of that that thinking around how <coughs> decisions are made in medical care actually has been shifting over the last 20 yeah. or 30 years. No, it's good, but it's a slow shift. Yeah. Let, let's move on, because I want to hit on a couple other points and sort of finish more or less on time. Um, again, the argument is, the, the, the suggestion I'm putting forward is get numbers, starting risk minus modified risk, and if you can get numbers, it means it's been tested and you can figure out how well the treatment works. If you can't get numbers, it hasn't been tested, and all bets are off. Okay. So let's go back to Dr. Prasad, because I think he had a very, very important quote picked up by the New York Times. All interventions sound good if you talk about the mechanisms, how it works. Well, you know, you have the polyp, and the polyp can grow, and the growth can expand, and then it metastasizes. You know, if you talk about the mechanics, you can't figure out if it's necessary or unnecessary. You can't figure out how well it works. They all sound good. Doctors are all well trained. They all make sort of logical, evidential sense. But don't focus on how it works. I'm sorry, it's low. I didn't know how to make the slides here. Focus as a patient, as a consumer, as a medical care consumer, focus on how well it works. You don't really care if the organ is cut in half and there's a third of the thing is cut out and then it's stitched up. I mean, that's, that's not, maybe it's interesting, I don't know. But you want to make sure that you get healthy at the end. So you want to know, start, you know, how well does it work? Does it work at all? Starting risk minus modified risk equals treatment benefit. So here's how I sort of suggest that people talk to the doctor. And my, my vision is that uh, <coughs> your broker Insurance carriers don't pick up on this stuff. Maybe your brokers do. Maybe your employer does if you're self-insured. 
and, and this is really, really old school, so forgive me, I mean, I'm pretty old. Um, you get a three by five card. Uh, do, does that know what three by five card is? <laughs> anyway, you get a three by five card, it's laminated, okay? Yeah. And it has these four questions on it. Out of 100 people like me, how many will have event X, die colon cancer, die breast cancer, lose your leg to diabetes, have a heart attack, or whatever. How many will have a VEDEX without a medical intervention? This is your starting risk question. This is exactly how to ask it. Out of 100 people like me, and then out of 100 people like me, how many will still have it with the medical intervention? The phrasing is really important. I'll show you why. So the treatment benefit question is, out of 100 people like me, how many actually benefit by avoiding a VEDEX? Be very clear. Um, people sometimes call, up and call me up and say, yeah, I saw your question. I just..." I sort of summarize. No, no, don't summarize. You feel like a complete idiot, by the way, when you read through the, you know, you read, Doc, my, my employer said I have to ask these questions. Employers, consent your people, give them 50 bucks to ask the questions. You'll end up cash ahead of them. And then, uh, whoops, sorry. Out of 100 people like me, how many are harmed by what is, okay? You have to ask exactly this way, and I want to show you why. You start off by asking, out of 100 people like me, and the reason for starting this way is you have to get a number as your answer. If you say, Doc, out of 100 people like me, how many will have a heart attack if they don't take statins? And the doctor will say, well, you know, statins are really good. They've shown, they've been proven to reduce the, okay, that doesn't matter. Out of 100 people answers the question, and here's why you have to phrase it exactly this way. And don't freestyle. Here are two different questions. Do statins reduce my risk of having a heart attack? Or out of 100 people like me, how many will have a heart attack if they don't take statins out of 100 people like me? How many will? Okay, here's why. Let's say you're starting, I, this is an example, I'm going to show you the reference coming up. Let's say your starting risk is 3 in 100. Okay. Let's, so in other words, how many people will have event X if they don't have a medical intervention? 3 over 5 years. How many people will still have it? 2. So you guys can all do the math. I, I used the calculator, but risk reduction was 1. Got it? Three, your starting risk is three, your modified risk is two, one person per hundred benefits over five years. So you can summarize this by saying, this treatment benefits one percent of people who have it. All right? This is pretty clear. I think you guys can all, okay. Let me show you another way of using exactly the same numbers. And just tell me which one you would, what your behavioral response would be. Same starting risk, okay? Nothing on my sleeve. That's why I roll on my sleeve. Nothing on my sleeve. Same modified risk. Risk reduction is one in three. This treatment cuts your risk by 36%. Who wants a 36% risk reduction? And who wants a treatment that benefits one in 100? It's exactly the same treatment. If your employees haven't been taught how to ask the right question, then you end up over here getting treatments that they may not want. Yeah? Does this apply to somebody that has a family history of... I'm just talking about a theoretical... This is just a theoretical... Because it's empowering the employee to make informed decisions yep. not based on necessarily... You know, because this could be a little confusing to some as far as numbers per se, whereas doctors know the numbers, but like say, for instance, I have a family history of diabetes. So I'm going to do everything I can to not get the diabetes. And clearly, we all know that one in three adults, not children, are probably going to have diabetes by 2018 or, or whatnot is what they're talking about. So I guess what I'm trying to understand is how, if I bring this back to my employee, how do I not confuse the hell out of them? <laughs> Oh, do you have the answer? No, but oh. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't. But as she was speaking, I think the important thing to ask, this is tricky, and yes, we're going to need a three by five to do it, but, but how many people like me? Exactly. So the like me is the yeah. history, yeah. the yeah. what okay. you're okay. doing for exercise, what you you're doing. You can just hold those for yeah. like 30 seconds, yeah. and yeah. we'll be there. But I want, to, I want to show you, I want to focus right now on the out of 100, yeah. okay? Because a slick marketer, can use this information to generate really different behavior on the part of consumers. Do you think a pharmaceutical company 
Would, how, how, how do you think a pharmaceutical company would present this? Oh, I wait to I got the all my numbers from this Lipitor ad that ran on the Wall Street Journal. Right. All right. Here's here's you guys probably can't read it from the back. This means in a large clinical study, three percent of patients taking a sugar pill or placebo had a heart attack, compared to two percent of patients taking Lipitor. Starting risk minus modified risk, thirty-six percent. You have to get. You have to follow the protocol, starting risk minus modified risk. That's why you say, out of 100 people like me, because you get numbers. Let me go to your point now. <clears throat> like me. Now, the data that are often reported tend to be group specific. So heart attack data, well, the classic study took place in Western Scotland. It's called the West of Scotland Coronary Prevention Study. Why that? Do any of you want to guess? I mean, that was a, sort of the first major study showing the stats work. Would anybody want to guess why, of all the places in the world, uh, Bristol Myers Swift decided to have a five year study in Western Scotland? Why not Ames, Iowa, the geographic center of the United States, or Oklahoma? You know? Yeah. Glasgow was the heart attack capital of the world. They had a higher rate of heart attacks than anybody else. It was a study of Obese smokers, 50% of the guys were smokers, they were, the average cholesterol level was 262 total cholesterol. Well, I'm not sure that that applies to me. I mean, I, I, I don't smoke. Okay. But, um, yeah, my wife has some comments about the rest of it. Anyway, um, but if you're, if you're a middle aged woman, you don't really care, a middle aged, non smoking woman who exercises. A study of obese, depressed smokers in Glasgow probably won't tell you a hell of a lot. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Implantable defibrillators. The FDA approved them based on a study mainly of men. Uh, you have heart failure and they implant this thing. But a study of women only found no benefits. This was the conclusion of the study reported by uh, the editor of JAMA Internal Medicine, no benefits to women of having implantable defibrillators. So, basically, so you want to have a study of people like me. Infrant implantable, I'm trying to say that. Uh -huh. yeah. Cost about 35 grand. So yes, you're, you're at higher risk. You're not at absolute risk. And so if you control, you know, this is, this is how, all I'm trying to help you do is frame your discussion with your doctor. Out of 100 people like me, how many are going to have diabetes over the next five years? How many can avoid, you know, how many will still have it if they have it? And also yeah, frame sure. it, I mean, empower your employees, challenge them to almost frame it around primary prevention. What can I do? What are the behaviors I can do? My employer is, you know, offering a fitness challenge and they're offering tobacco cessation. I know that those are the big risk factors for me to have a heart attack or, or whatnot. You know what I mean? So I think framing it in that light will kind of promote behavior change? Because uh, otherwise use, they... Use the, form, use the format any way you want to. Uh, what I would hope people do is not take medications where for them the harm succeeds the benefits. Yeah, obviously. You know, and you who are employers trying to control your budgets, you, well, you get the idea. Um, and just note that high cholesterol doesn't mean high cholesterol. High cholesterol might be total cholesterol 201, it might be 375. You get a bigger harm farther from the norm and a bigger benefit. So if your cholesterol level is 375, I would make really different decisions, probably, than if my cholesterol level was 201. All right? It doesn't, it's not um, binary, you know, either you do or you don't, it's gradual. All right, um, and finally, just a quick comment about what is it, you know, out of 100 people, how many, like me, how many will, event, will look, uh, avoid Event X. <clears throat> there are two different kinds of outcomes that we tend to confuse in this country. One is test outcomes, like cholesterol levels or blood pressure levels or blood sugar levels or something like that. Whoops. Yeah, this is kind of hard to use. Um, yeah, right. And the other is what we call patient outcomes heart attack, strokes, diabetes, would you like diabetes, diabetes, breast cancer, whatever. If you say to your doctor, out of 100 people like me, how many will avoid a heart attack, you know, starting with my plant fibers, if they take a statin, and your doctor says, well, it's going to lower your cholesterol levels, and cholesterol correlates, you know, is a, is a cause. 
So lowering your cholesterol level is a good thing. No, that's completely fallacious. Throw that out and change doctors. That doesn't take you anywhere. I'll show you why. Some of you may have heard of a drug called Zetia. Now, Zetia is manufactured on the market, but it's still on the market, by um, Merck, the biggest pharmaceutical manufacturer in the world. <coughs> Zetia is a cholesterol lowering medication that blocks the absorption of cholesterol in, this kind of, sounds kind of gross, in your intestines, not your liver. Statins block the cholesterol absorption in your liver. So you take Zetia, you can take it with a statin because it works in different organs and it, and it benefits. So it's a cholesterol lowering medication and it works well. Zetia lowers cholesterol. It's a cholesterol lowering medication. It's supposed to lower cholesterol. Here's a statement uh, from one of their ads. I forgot to bring it with me. It's also on their website. <coughs> in a clinical study, people who added Zetia to their statin medication reduced their bad cholesterol on average by an additional 25%. Okay. So Zetia lowers cholesterol. All right? And it really does a good job lowering cholesterol. So if you want to measure cholesterol lower, I'm trying to belabor this point. If you want to uh, uh, measure your cholesterol at the beginning, at the end, you take Zetia, you get lower cholesterol. I'm sold. Okay, really works well. Here's the statement that also appears in their print advertisement and appears on their website. Oh boy. <laughs> Unlike some statins, Zetia has not been shown to prevent heart, heart disease or heart attack. Somehow or other, Merck has manufactured a drug that lowers cholesterol without having any event <laughs> implications. Don't ask me how. I'm not about that. I only quote their website. So you can take this drug until the cows come home and get no benefit. There are articles that appear in the various journals titled, Why Would Anyone Take Zetia? It doesn't make any sense at all unless you ask the wrong question. And the doctor says, your cholesterol's high, you have liver problems or whatever, I'm gonna recommend Zetia because it will lower cholesterol by operating on your intestines. And you say, okay, great, Doc, thanks, because I have liver issues, whatever. <laughs> and it does, this, is, this drug has not been proven to do anything at all. Those of you who are, by the way, concerned about cost, it sells uh, about uh, two billion a year. Yeah, yeah. I just helped to clarify the confusion. Uh, cholesterol has no relationship to heart attacks. Yeah. Period. Okay. Um, and it's been an assumption for years. Look at the research. That's not where it's going. Mm. Um, and um, at the same time, we have statins, which, by the way, lower that risk by that one percent. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, which then translate to 36%. So we've got the whole world on statins. It's crazy. Yeah, about a third of Americans over age 45 and right. take statins. Yeah. And we have the highest heart attack levels in the world. Right. Makes sense at all. Yeah. I think also just um, within the past week, there was, uh, there was news out that was saying that, pe that um, people who take cholesterol-lowering medication are actually not working, they're not working to, their cholesterol levels are not going down because they're not, they're using the pill and they're not adopting their lifestyles. Right. So, right. so it's, it was just some study that just came out. And I think it's one of those things, again, that um, to help people make informed decisions of, you know, yes, it's the, it's the preventative uh, lifestyle. It's not popping the pill. It's definitely not popping an expensive pill that has a very low, um, um, ability to, to lower your risk and, and putting all those things together um, is really Yeah, let me important. pick up on that point because we've just been hired by uh, uh, a broker, an agency, to work on that particular issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'll, I'll end that. What, am I, I'm supposed to end like right now. Right? Yeah, no, you're okay. You're okay. 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 I'm a um, timekeeper. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, uh, there's an agency that has, has hired us to work on um, uh, sort of one class of medication problems with them. And here's, here's the research that they've found. As you move to a higher deductible plan, there's more out-of-pocket uh, medication costs for people, you get those. And they're finding that the compliance rates with the doctor's recommendations are going down, all right? So the doctor says, for example, um, I'm not breaking any confidences, I'm just giving a hypothetical here, um, that, uh, that uh, you should be on a stat. Okay, fine, cool. Fine. You go out of 100 people like me, how many will have a heart attack that don't take the statin out of 100, and you decide that the benefit of the statin is good enough, the doctor puts you on a prescription. But you don't get any benefit from that prescription if you've decided to take it. 
If it's too expensive, you stop buying pills. So what this particular agency has done is say, okay, when your doctor prescribes something like that, the employer will pay for it, all right? Because we find that compliance with physician recommendations is so important that the employer is going to kick it in. Okay, that's part of the plan. They, kind of, they asked us to come in and put together a tutorial to explain to people that sometimes medications are good and sometimes they're not. How do you think about this? We'll go through the, uh, the questions. So we've, we're developing a tutorial to tell people, so if you want your employer to pay for it, which increases compliance rates and then gets you healthier, you want your employer to pay for it, you've got to take this tutorial. And that they're, so we're trying to use economic incentives to get people to learn this stuff, plan design uh, issues, to get people to learn how to do this. And then we've had an initial discussion about giving people a little card, literally, where they go in and the doctor says, uh, I, I recommend they be put on a statin. And then you say, well, out of 100 people like me, how many will have a heart attack if they don't? You know, take statin out of 100 people. And then, you know, you put in the answers and, and trying to get a doctor to initial that, of course. And that's what the doctor says. What yeah. do you do? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's where we are. It's trying to integrate the e economic incentives that you can build into plan design with uh, in consumer economy. So, anyway. Uh, uh, Q&A. Q&A? Okay, fine. Q&A. Uh, a. You have Q. Okay, I got it. I was hoping you were going to clarify an earlier statement. When in the beginning you said um, you don't think medical prices should be, you don't think consumers of medicine should be basing their decision on pricing and the transparency of all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yet the rest of your presentation was empowering by knowledge and knowing the numbers. Yeah. So I have a hard time balancing the two, especially we all want the best doctor, yeah. but price comes into effect, especially as deductible plans rise. Yeah, yeah. And even like maybe you don't care how much the surgeon is yeah. that's going to operate on you, but maybe where you choose to get your x-ray, your lab work done, your MRI, all of those prices fluctuate drastically throughout that Absolutely. Healthcare system. First of all, yeah. determine if you need medical care. All right? If you don't need it, don't get it in the first place. If your starting risk is too low, don't do it. If the medical intervention is the delta between starting risk and modified risk is too small, don't get it. Okay? First criteria, do I need the care? Second criteria, what are my treatment options? Uh, I could take a statin, I could have an angi angiogram, I could have an angioplasty, I could have something else. You know, what are my range of treatment options? that will get me to the desired end product. And according to research, you have options 90% of the time. So it's at least, <clears throat> so you have at least two things to think about. Third, so number one, do I need the care? Number two, what are my options to get a good medical outcome? Third, who are the best providers of those options? Is the local hospital good at whatever it is that I want? Or is there a better hospital in Boston? I don't know. Um, once you've decided you need the care, you want to do it this way, and this provider is the best, then sure, go look at prices. That's cool. Um, yeah, great. Look at price four. Price is the fourth, the least important in my opinion. You can disagree. Go ahead. Tell me where I'm wrong. You got the floor. Um, well, that's a great thought process yeah. for a lot of things, but when you fall and sprain your wrist and you don't know if it's broken, the choice between an urgent walk-in place versus an ER is a huge cost difference. So when we're talking about the cost of health care and how to reduce it, knowing what you're paying for is hugely important. And name another industry in which you can get a service and then not know what you're going to pay for before. Yeah, the, you can't get an oil change and say, oh, go change my oil. I don't know what it's going to cost. Yeah, you know? the, the point is, of disagreement, and I unfortunately ran out of time, I do have a tutorial about back pain and back imaging. Um, it, and again, MRI prices, as you know, are all over the place. Uh, the consensus in the medical community is don't have, an, don't have a scan at all, period, for six weeks. So the point where I disagree with you, I mean, I understand what you're saying. And, and, I think, and there's validity that if it's 1000 bucks here, 400 bucks there, we're going to 400 out. I don't, I don't disagree with that. But don't get the stuff you don't need. And I think if we talk about price, damn it, people go get the cheapest unnecessary care. So, sure. uh, in, in your, I'm a physical therapist, so I deal with back pain all the time. 100%, go with, don't get the scan first because you're going to see things that might deter the actual treatment. So there you I'm, go, yeah. You're right. absolutely right. Yeah. But going to a physical therapist that's based in a hospital, <clears> system, <throat> an outpatient, come in at 2 o'clock, you leave at 2.30, 2.45, that's based in a hospital, 
versus a private practice, the prices are different. Yep. And I think it's important to know that. Yeah. Just because, I mean, the, yep. the, it has drastic uh, effects throughout all of healthcare. Julie, straighten this I up. I think just the transparency discussion has two numbers also, and that is the the quality and the cost, like the quality, not uh, the cost, not in the vacuum, without looking at, at the cost um, and quality together. And and I think that Gary likes to really, I think he likes <laughs> to, to stir it up, like you know, like wow. that. I I I am a proponent of transparency in in um, healthcare. And so when Gary says that, it's sort of like grates on what, you know, what I hope to see in, in the advancement of um, information to us as healthcare consumers in the future. But I think just it's just it's like one of those things that, um, you know, when I've told people don't don't get it's like don't get an MRI on your knee if you're not prepared to, to go through with any treatment. If you like want to know what's wrong with it, but you're not willing to to you know go forward with with treatment unless unless your physical therapist needs you to get an MRI before they're willing to work on it that's a different story yeah. um, unfortunately but, Julie knows me pretty well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else so, or are we done? so we're gonna sure. go ahead and uh, wrap off and then take a quick break and we'll reconvene at about five minutes to 11 if you can all right great thanks, thanks Gary <laughs>